may well be puzzled by the title. Why three Chinas? Am I talking about uh, the mainland and Taiwan? No, that's two, not three. Or the mainland China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, or Macau? No, that's four. Again, not three. Actually, I'm talking about the mainland China itself. The truth is, geographically, there is only one entity of mainland China, but politically, e economically, sociologically, and even sentimentally, it has largely broken into two societies. And we, the Chinese Democrats, with the support and help from the good people around the world, like those at the Human Rights Foundation, have tried to bring this bring together these two severely separated China and construct a society built upon universal values. That is the third China, a democratic China we are working on. Over the past 20 years, after Tiananmen Square, the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party regime, has established as the world watches a two-China structure in one of the two Chinas, which I call China Inc., is formed by the officials, red capitalists, co-opted business elite and cultural elites. And through marriage between power and capital, and shares opened to domestic and foreign capitalists. Today, China Inc is dazzling the entire world with its wealth, might, and glory. It dominates the public discourse that the outside observers believe it represents China, the whole of China. But the truth is, there is another society named China, a society made of over a billion Chinese who are virtually slave laborers working for China Inc. I call this second China, the under China. There is an unprecedented wealth gap between these two Chinas. Citizens of the under China constantly subject to exploitation and persecution are unable to enjoy basic benefits or constitutionally afforded the civil and the political rights. The two Chinas no longer speak a common political language and have no common political life. To maintain the two China structure, on top of the traditional lies and the violence that every autocratic ruler uses, the CCP regime has developed new tactics. It is comprised in the shape of a dragon. Here you go. The body, sustaining economic growth at all costs to maintain the regime's ruling legitimacy. Two wings, appeasing the elite with corruption and suppressing the powerless with rogue police. Two claws. I don't know a how many claws a, a dragon has. I have not seen one, but I said two claws. Purging citizen advocates like Liu Xiaobo and blocking public opinion. Dao Aung San Suu Kyi has recently observed, it is not a power that corrupts, but fear. Fear of losing power corrupts those who have it. The China we view today reflects her wisdom. The CCP's regime's paranoid fear allows it to imprison and torture its best and brightest citizens. In considering this regime's record, we need to look no further than these individuals, groups, events, and the policies. The Tiananmen Massacre, Tiananmen Mothers, Charter 08, Liu Xiaobo and his wife, Liu Xia, Wang Bingjiang, Gao Zhisheng, Liu Xianbin, Chen Guangcheng, Ai Weiwei, Tibetans 
Uyghurs, Mongolians, house churches, Falun Gong, forced abortions, forced evictions, forced disappearances, black jails. And this is the regime. This is the same regime whose foreign policies and models of repression enable the morally and the philosophically bankrupt regimes like that of North Korea, Syria, Iran, to suck the lives, the freedoms, dignities, and the wealth from their own people. My earlier quote of Da Aung San Suu Kyi about the fear of losing power was incomplete. Following what I quoted, she also said, fear of the scourge of power corrupts those who are subject to it. This fear has not only worked in China, but also gone beyond its borders. This regime, to use the words of a recent uh, torture victim of China, is spoiled by the Western countries, particularly the US. The world history tells us that no country that treats its own people harshly can be relied on to treat another country's people with compassion. This polarized two China structure also poses a direct and a real threat to the peace and the security of all people everywhere around the globe. Are the collective wills of the world's greatest democracy so impotent that they cannot react? No, I don't think so. Our confidence will be emboldened if we understand that the people of China too want human rights. This sentence sounds a bit awkward with a word too there. I put it there because the truth that the people of China want human rights has not only been suppressed by the Chinese communist regime, but is too often overlooked by the world community. For those who are skeptical, let me propose the following thought experiment for you to judge for yourself. Imagine that you visit China, taking with you a copy of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Arbitrarily choose a citizen on the street, show the document, asking them with a language they can understand whether they want the rights listed there. What would you expect them to say? Would you for a second believe they would say, no, I don't want these rights? Of course you wouldn't. You see, you understand the Chinese people through understanding yourself. Nobody wants to be a slave. In this regard, the Chinese people are no different than any other people in the world. The thirst for freedom and dignity is indeed universal. The people of China have long ago begun the search for dignity, justice, goodness, fairness, equality, freedom, and brotherhood. They have produced a few major pushes toward these goals in this generation. We all remember in 1989, Tiananmen Square democracy movement, the Chinese people courageously stood up against government corruption that, in the words of a Charter 08, has corrupted human intercourse. They stood up for freedom and democracy. The image of a lone man standing in front of a string of tanks has in inspired the entire world. And our fallen brothers' spirit have been one of the greatest source of inspiration for continued struggle for these noble goals today in China. The Nobel Peace Prize awarded to my friend and colleague Liu Xiaobo has had a remarkable impact on the hearts of the people of China. Over the past two years, 
The civil movement has become increasingly mature, skillful, and resilient, as evidenced by three cases: Chen Guangcheng, Ai Weiwei, and the Wukan villagers. All took place amid the latest round of a heavy-handed crackdown on dissent after the Arab Spring. With a clear direction, the civil movement will grow to exert greater and greater pressure on the communist regime. As people's forces grow and the civil protests escalate, the struggle for power among different factions within the communist regime will become more pronounced. Once external pressures reach a critical mass, Rival factions within the CCP will have no choice but to take the voices of the citizens more seriously and seek their support to survive. No one can predict with precision when the moment of a democratic opening for change will come in China. Virtually. Every one of the 60-some peaceful transitions to democracy in the past few decades have come as a surprise to the U.S. One reason is that diplomats, academics, and policymakers generally do not pay attention to what's happening with the people, with the street-level society and the culture. Of the world's not free countries. Above all else, we must maintain our faith in my compatriots that they can and will join join the vast majority of the world peoples who now live in free or at least partly free countries. An opening for change could come. In the next few months, or it may take a few more years, or even decades, but it will never come without collective efforts, including those from the international community. So, we must persevere and keep the faith, and be ready. Thank you. Yeah.